Welcome to Lessons in the Wilderness from the books of Exodus and Numbers. Now, clearly, I'm not in the wilderness. I'm right here in my office, and I suspect you're not in the wilderness either. You're probably in your home. So in this introductory lesson today, I want to just set the table for what I mean by lessons in the wilderness and what I hope we can accomplish through this study. By the way, Thank you for joining us here on Wednesday night. Um, we're excited that a lot of our Wednesday night ministries have begun again tonight, September 16th. But we understand that some of you are not comfortable yet joining us in person, and we understand that. That's fine, and that's why we wanted to give you this online option. Now, you know that recently on Sunday mornings, we finished our sermon series in the book of Exodus. And as I considered what to teach in this study, I thought it would be fruitful for us to dig a little bit deeper into the book of Exodus, on into the book of Numbers, to consider the journey of the Israelites, especially as they journeyed through the wilderness. And then rather than just learn about their journey, I thought it would be helpful for us to apply the lessons to our own journey, and more specifically, to our journey through this pandemic. Now listen, I know you're probably weary of talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. I am too. But I think there's some applicable lessons we can learn that I haven't really heard much talk about. And I hope that we don't miss the opportunity that the pandemic has given us. Here's my initial challenge. Don't waste the pandemic. Don't waste the pandemic. What do I mean by this? Well, just imagine years down the road, you're telling your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren about the year 2020. Now, what are you going to tell them? I suspect we're all going to say we were inconvenienced. Restaurants are closed, entertainment's shut down, sports postponed, stuck at home, we, we had to wear a mask. Um, all these things are real. They're things that we've experienced together. We've We've, we've been inconvenienced, that's true. Secondly, when you talk about 2020, you might share your opinion about the virus. I'm not getting into it here, but everyone has their own opinion about the pandemic and how it should be handled. In fact, you may have different opinions about how our churches handled it. We understand that. Everyone has formed their own opinion, and, um, and that's okay. In the future, we may talk about our opinions about the pandemic. Third, um, there may be some of you listening here who've actually suffered, or maybe you know someone who's suffered, someone who's lost a loved one, someone who has fought the virus and has survived, has ongoing issues. Some of you, some of us may have suffered from anxiety, depression, some other side effects of the whole pandemic. Some people lost their jobs. Business owners have, have struggled in their businesses, they've suffered there. Even ministries have suffered in some ways. For example, um, just thinking about our work, our mission work in San Pancho, we haven't been able to continue that in person. We try to do things online, but we, we haven't been able to do that in person. So in some ways we could say a lot of things have been put on hold or a lot of things may have suffered because of the pandemic. That may be your story to tell in the future. But here's my question. Is that all we have to share? Is that it? To share, um, have we been inconvenienced? What our opinion was about it or how we suffered? When I say don't waste the pandemic, here's what I'm talking about. Let's, let's, let's look at a couple questions. Here are my questions. Number one, do we believe that God is sovereign and he's in control? You know, as believers, it's easy for us to say a quick, oh yeah, God's in control. We know that. We know the right answer. But are we truly trusting Him through this pandemic? Or are we acting as if it's beyond His control? Secondly, do you believe God's working in the midst of the pandemic? You know, like I said, a lot of ministries have had to pause. We're thankful that tonight, even Wednesday night, a lot of ministries are restarting. But does that mean that no ministry has happened over the last few months? Well, of course not. Does it mean that God stopped working, that God is just waiting for the pandemic to be over so He can resume working? Of course not. 
but I'm afraid sometimes we act like that. Last question. I want to get really personal right here. Really personal. As we consider what our story will be down the road when we tell our children, our grandchildren, friends, others about the year 2020, let me ask you this question. What has God been doing in you and through you during the pandemic? In other words, if we believe God's sovereign, if we believe He's always working, then would He not be working in and through our lives individually and personally through all this? So down the road, I hope you have another story to tell, and that's a spiritual journey. I hope you tell the story of what God did in your life through the pandemic, how He changed you. Um, not, not just the suffering, not just the inconvenience, not even just some things that we learned, but how He changed you and what He did through the pandemic, the eternal perspective of it. That's the story that I hope you'll be able to tell. And that's the story we're going to be looking at in the case of the Israelites in the wilderness. I hope we can consider the similarities of the Israelites, what they experienced in the wilderness, to what we're experiencing right now in this pandemic. I hope you'll oblige me here and allow me to draw out the similarities in their journey and in our, our journey. And I hope that in the end, we'll all have a spiritual journey to share a, a, a testimony of what God has done in our lives through the pandemic. Now, you, 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 you may not be able to say how God's worked in your life to this point, and that's okay. That's why we're doing this study. Maybe you have ways that God has worked in your life fantastic. I don't believe he stopped yet. I think he wants to continue. So we're going to look at this through a Bible study. So before we dig into the scripture, let's pray today before we look at his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of the Israelites, how you rescued them from Egypt, and how you gave us details of their journey along the way. Father, help us as we look at your holy word that we can learn from their experiences, that we can apply um, apply what we've learned to our experiences, that we'll see similarities, that you'll teach us through this, not just, Father, so we'll have more head knowledge, but, Father, that we'll have more heart knowledge and that we'll apply this to, um, to become more like Jesus and to accomplish the purpose for which you've created us and the way that you're leading us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So to begin, let's, let's spend a little bit here reviewing what we learned in our sermon series in Exodus to get us started. So Exodus chapter 1, I'm going to read starting verse 11, 11 through 14. It says, So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Python and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Israelites oppressed them, the more, I'm sorry, the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all of their demands. So we all know as believers that the spiritual application of, of the, the Israelites in bondage is sin. We all have a sin nature. We all commit sin. And without God's redemption, we're in bondage to that and the penalties of it. The Egyptians, it says it worked the Israelites, they worked the Israelites with no mercy. Consider the contrast of what we're going to see about God's mercy. No mercy and God's mercy. It's quite a contrast and a great picture of, um, of salvation and redemption. Moving forward in the book of Exodus, we know that in order to control the Israelites, they ordered that all of the male babies be killed. And then we know the story of Moses, how he was placed in a basket, how it's a great picture even of, of the ark of, of Moses being saved in that basket on the river. And the Lord raising up Moses as he grew up because he had a plan for his life and he wanted to use him. Jump down to chapter 2, verse 23. Chapter 2, 23. 
through 25, it says, Years passed, the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and He remembered His covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel, and He knew it was time to act. So the Israelites continued to suffer. They cry out. God heard their heard their cry for help. It says he remembered his promises. In other words, his, his covenant to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, his promise to lead him to the Holy Land, to the promised land. It says he looked down on them in their situation. And I love that last phrase where it says he knew, he knew that it was time to act. You know, here's, a, here's something we can apply already right here in this introduction that, um, that, that here God was demonstrating that His timing is often different than ours. You know, 2020 is not going like any of us expected it to. Most of us have been praying for the, the pandemic to end. We don't even know when that's going to happen. We wanted this over months ago. The truth is that God wasn't surprised by it. He's not just waiting and watching for it to, to finish. He, he is watching and listening to our prayers, yet there's a purpose in His timing, and it's often different than what we would want. He will act when He's ready. You see that they had suffered for years here, and, and then the Lord said, okay, now I know it's time for me to act. There's a purpose in His timing. Look down at chapter 3, verse 7. It says, the Lord told him. He's talking to Moses. It says, the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now, go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. So again, the Lord says, I've seen the oppression. In other words, there's nothing that goes on that he doesn't already know about, that he hasn't seen or observed, that he doesn't, he's not aware of. It says he was very aware of their suffering. Listen, the Lord knows how we've suffered, how we've been inconvenienced. There's no doubt he knows that. Verse 8, really powerful verse right here, where it says, um, in verse 8, So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. Think about that for a minute. I've come down to rescue them. I've come to rescue them, to free them from their bondage. But not only that, not just to get them away from the Egyptians, but it says there's another promise. The promise is to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey that we know as the promised land. Again, a great picture of salvation and God's plan for our lives. Out of sin to freedom, but also to an inheritance and an eternal home. The books here, um, Exodus and Numbers, that we're going to be looking at, they're really written, uh, the way we're applying this is for believers. But all through the Old Testament, we've already seen it, the Old Testament already begins to reveal God's redemptive plan. We don't have to wait for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get to the Gospel. We can find the Gospel right here, in the Old Testament as they're looking forward to Jesus where we are looking back at what Jesus has already done. So um, as, as we see here, the Lord said, I've come to rescue them. And you know, if we look at the picture of the whole Bible, that's what the whole Bible really is, is God's redemptive plan. So right here, I don't, I don't want to miss this. I said we're really going to apply this for believers. But in your life, if, if you don't feel like you've been redeemed, if you've been rescued yet, if you've been, we used the word saved before, born again, if you don't feel like you've had that experience, then 
I, 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 I wouldn't want to go through this journey with you and not challenge you to surrender your life to Christ. One time on the mission field, a young man, as we're sharing with him, he, uh, we met with him again, and he came to me and he said, why hasn't God come to save me yet? In other words, he knew he needed to be saved. He knew that God could save him, and he knew that it hadn't yet happened. He was saying a whole lot in that one little question right there, why hasn't God come to save me yet? Now, in some ways, he's expressing some faith just in asking that question. So it's a great question to ask. The Lord said here, I've heard their, their cries. I'm aware of their suffering, so I've come down to rescue them. I just want to say that Jesus can rescue you too. If you never surrendered your life to Christ, I believe that would be His desire that you do that right now. Now, for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Christ, I think as we journey through this story, even right here, as the Lord uh, talk to Moses. Moses had some doubts. I don't think you can use me, Lord. I'm not a very good speaker and all that kind of thing. The Lord doesn't make mistakes. And I believe just as He wanted to use Moses, I think He wants to use all of us, even in the midst of the circumstances that we're in right now. So, in the next few chapters in the book of Exodus, what we see, um, most of you know that, that, that we get into all the plagues and God demonstrates His power and he shows how powerful that he is over nature and all those things. Um, we see a great another picture of salvation when we when we look at the Passover and and how that's demonstrated of the shedding of blood for the remission of sins. We see that in the Passover, and then in chapter thirteen, we um, we we finally get to the point where Pharaoh agreed to let the people go. In other words, not just when Pharaoh decided but in God's timing when He was ready for the people to be released. So, most of you know how the story goes after this, right? Pharaoh releases them, but the story's really not over yet. It's not like he's released and they go to the Promised Land. Um, right here, even the Egyptians chase them. They go after them. So, as we begin to um, consider the topic of the wilderness, I found this really interesting right here in verse... 13, before they get to the Red Sea, um, let's look at chapter 13, verse 17. Verse 17 in chapter 13. It says, When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the Promised Land. God said if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So, God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness to the Red Sea. Thus, the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. So, Pharaoh let them go, but the Lord didn't lead them down the main road. Can you imagine if you're one of the Israelites and you're finally released, you're celebrating, okay, we're going to the promised land, there's the main road, let's go. And the Lord says, nope. We're not going to take the main road. I mean, don't we want to go the quickest way, the easiest way, what we think is the best way? But God knew something that they didn't. He knew that that wasn't the best way. He knew that going into the Philistine territory that they would face a battle. And He knew that it's likely that they might turn back, even going back to slavery. So here's a, here's a great point of application for us right here. Sometimes God protects us from things that we don't even know, that, we don't, that we're not aware of. Sometimes He leads us in ways that are best for us, even when we might disagree. The Lord says He was concerned that they might turn back. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a bad thought, going back to their bondage, not going with where He wanted to take them if they faced difficulty. So... You know, for us, often when we're saved, we might have the thought that once we're saved, that everything is great. Everything's going to be perfect. It's just going to be peachy now. But in reality, the, the Bible tells us, it warns us that that's often not true, that things will be difficult, that we will suffer, and they aren't just going to be peachy all the way. But we've got the promise that the Lord's going to be with us and He's going to sustain us and take care of us through those things. 
I like verse um, 18 where it says, uh, he said, so God led them in a roundabout way. A roundabout way. You know what a roundabout is, right? It's this traffic circle where you go in and then there are several exits off of it. One time on a mission trip, I was driving a rental car. Now in this country, you drive on the left-hand side of the road. So already I was pretty much lost and confused and didn't know what I was doing. It was very awkward. On top of that, they had a whole bunch of roundabouts. So I'm, I'm going into this roundabout on the left-hand side of the road, and can you imagine going around the roundabout trying to figure out how, which exit to take and how to do it, how to, how to get on the proper side of the road. So I ended up circling this thing about three or four times. Of course, the, the people in the car with me, they were very encouraging. They were laughing the whole time. It was pretty funny because I'm just circling this thing trying to figure out how do I exit, which side of the road do I take when I do exit, not to mention all the traffic that's there at the same time. Well, this says the Lord led them in a roundabout way. Now, they probably weren't going in circles like I was going in circles, but it, it, it says He led them a roundabout way through the wilderness, not the main road, a roundabout way through the wilderness. So right here in chapter 13, before the Red Sea crossing, we see this picture of the wilderness already and a path that's different than what they might have expected or they might have wanted. In, in my New Living Bible here, it says, NLT Bible, it says, Israel's wilderness detour. In 2020, do you feel like um, you've been detoured? Do you feel like you've, you've been taken off the main road? Do you feel like you're back on the back roads? Um, there are no convenience stores, no restaurants, uh, no entertainment, a lot of potholes in the road. You're, you're really not sure where you are. Your GPS isn't working, your phone signal's not good. Is that how you feel? Or you could feel stuck at home you wish you could get out on the main road. You wish you could go somewhere. You feel like you've been stuck in one place. You wish like you could accomplish something. Well, I'm sure the Israelites felt that way. They felt helpless. They felt confused. They felt like they were lost at some time, at some point. So there are a lot of similarities that I see in their journey and ours when we start thinking about going a roundabout way in the wilderness in a different way than we might want. Now, each week, um, each week in this study, as we look at it, I hope to um, give you a few questions of application. I'm going to hope to keep this relatively short, but I hope that you can spend some more time on these scriptures and more time considering what we've talked about and really applying these lessons personally in your life. In other words, don't waste the pandemic in your own life. So here are a couple application questions. Number one, what are some of the ways that you've suffered or been inconvenienced? I, I challenge you, take some time and write these down. One column, here's how I've suffered. Another column, here's how I've been inconvenienced. Now, I, I don't wanna take anything away from suffering because suffering is real and some of you may have suffered. But I suspect for most of us, this column of being inconvenienced is gonna be a whole lot longer than the column where we've truly suffered, if we're honest with ourselves. And then when we look at this column of have we been inconvenienced, I think we're gonna see how trivial some of those things are. It's gonna put some things back in perspective when we think with an eternal perspective. Second application question. Do you believe God's been working through this pandemic? If so, how? I challenge you to write down the ways you've seen the Lord moving, maybe in your life, maybe in someone else's life, in our church, maybe in the world. How have you seen the Lord moving? How has He moved during this pandemic? What have you seen Him do? And then third, here's probably the toughest question of the three. Are you willing to ask God to use you? Are you willing to ask Him how He might use you even in the circumstances that you found yourself. You may find, you know, if the pandemic wasn't here, there are all kinds of ways that you may like to serve or enjoy serving and you're a faithful servant. But during this time, when you can't do some of those things, how can he use you? Do you believe he can? Serve someone in need, call and check on somebody. 
have, a, have an intentional gospel conversation with somebody? How is a way that you could reach out to someone right now and allow the Lord to use you in the midst of the circumstances? I hope you'll take some time and consider those questions. Now, next week, um, lesson two, we're going to pick right back up where we left off. We're going to pick up in chapter 13, verse 20, where it says the Israelites left Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. So here we are at the edge of the wilderness. They're going to begin their journey through the wilderness. We're going to follow it next week through the Red Sea in chapter 14. So we're going to dig deeper next week. We're going to look at how the Lord led them and why He led them in the way that He did. Don't waste the pandemic. I know you want, won't. I've got confidence in you. Let's pray in this day today. Father, we thank you for, um, again, for your word. I pray, Father, for those who will spend a little more time in these scriptures that you'll speak to them personally. Father, that we'll just all be uh, transparent and honest before you about what you want to do in our lives, what you want to teach us, how you want to change us, and how you want to use us. Father, we, um, we trust you'll get all the glory through all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week.